Welcome back. How do mental health illnesses affect our brain and our behaviors? How do we understand this topic from a religious lens? To help us explore this, we'll sit down and talk to Dr. Marwa as a lecturer and adjunct professor at California State University at the Canadian Muslim Mental Health Conference here in Toronto. Dr. Marwa Azib completed her master's in counseling and her doctorate in neuroscience. She currently teaches psychology and human development at Cal State University, Long Beach. Let's get her perspectives on understanding mental health from a scientific and religious perspective. Welcome to the show, Dr. Marwa. Uh, thank you. So, uh, you know, you presented at this conference today talking about mm -hmm. spirituality and science. Now, why is it important for spirituality to be in the mainstream sphere of mental health? having spirituality or religiosity be something a factor that's worth studying which is, has been in research and showing that spirituality and spiritual and uh, religiosity um, is a, a very strong influential psychosocial factor that is going to benefit mental health physical health uh, relationships is really important and that's what research has shown because as a result of this research accumulating now hospitals have chaplain for people who are sick um, universities have spiritual counseling or a chaplain also on campus. They'll usually provide different chaplains from the different faiths. So Sunnybrook just down the street, they have religious and spiritual care and they will specifically describe that this is a very integral and important part of the treatment for the patients. Now I know for our audience this is probably the first time where they're hearing or maybe you know maybe they've heard it but it's not so common that there is research and studies out there showing that spirituality and religiosity does have an impact on mental health. So you can you share a bit of that research or studies that you've come across? Okay, so there isn't just a few studies here and there. There's actually entire centers that oh, are wow. dedicated on university campus for studying uh, religiosity and spirituality and their effect on health, such as the one uh, by uh, the director, Koeng, and he has an entire center at Duke University that looks at just that relationship. Wow. And pretty much the consistent results that we see study after study, that um, active engagement and authentic belonging to a religion uh, and by authentic or sincere I mean that they are actively engaging in the rituals of that religion they are uh, reading the literature of that religion um, not just going to that religion institution the the masjid or the at church face value. exactly at, exactly and um, that actually that at face value is actually detrimental to health mm -hmm. so but if you are, do have that authentic relationship and you're engaging in these rituals and reading of the scriptures and all of that that study after study whether it's from his center or other places Places have shown that religiosity and spirituality has a really um, amazing effect on mental and physical health. In fact, some of these effects are so enormous that if you were, if a pharmaceutical company will come and say that, well, I can increase or, or turn back the clock seven to 14 years if you buy this pill, people would be willing to pay thousands of dollars. Well, research on religiosity, active religiosity and spirituality has shown that, that it can turn back the clock by seven to 14 years. Wow. So another study, this is a really interesting study, where they looked at people who've had like a heart condition, a surgery, and in that unit, in the heart unit, they um, asked people who don't know the patients to pray for the patients. They gave them a okay. brief description. Now the patients didn't know they were getting prayed for. So a computer just randomized and said, this patient is gonna get prayed for, this patient is not. And what they did is that um, then looked at the differences between the patients that were prayed for by people they didn't know. It's completely double blind. And is this focused on Muslims or this is, uh, this uh, is all, people of all faiths? All, okay. all faith. And um, then what they found is that people who were prayed for, that they were so much less likely, I can't remember the number, I think it was five times less likely to get antibiotics after the surgery. They were less likely to die as a result of the surgery wow. or to require a mechanical ventilator. So. Wow, I've never, I mean, I'm very, yeah. like, this is amazing because you don't really hear yes, about it's, this. It's mainstream studies, right? It's really, uh, studies are focusing in that. And even there was um, the first national longitudinal study that followed students for a few years at UCLA um, just released some interesting findings, like the ones they released in 2010, where they said that students who um, go or search for spiritual growth, that they are more likely to um, show leadership, to do academically well, mm -hmm. um, so basically overall make the college experience much more enjoyable and then also be released into adulthood or real life wow. as much more wholesome. 
I know when I was doing my PhD at UCI that one student actually killed himself, committed suicide as a result of being overwhelmed wow. and probably not having that yeah. spiritual counseling yeah. that might have helped. So let me take this back to the Islamic context. You know, in Islam, we have principles about, you know, sorry, not principles, but uh, as part of our pillars, we have to pray five times a day. We're encouraged to ha read morning prayers, evening, after mm -hmm. nighttime prayers. Now, how does this practically, you mentioned seven to 14 years, if you have mm -hmm. religiosity, it helps you, ex mm -hmm. extends your life. How can these uh, prayers and things that we do in Islam actually impact the brain? Okay, so really interesting question. Um, so first of all, uh, just to summarize what we said, we've said that uh, most of the literature that looked at religiosity and spirituality that is active, mm -hmm. that includes not just faith and um, authenticity in terms of the faith with God, but also actions and rituals and reading of scriptures. Um, and we said that that has a positive um, effect on, on mental illness and on uh, physical. Mm -hmm. Now in Islam, uh, we are encouraged to memorize the Quran, to contemplate verses from the Quran, yes. to think about the Quranic verses. But I wanna focus a little bit about memorizing Quran or memorizing verses, that one. And then also we have prayers, du'as, dua or a prayer yep. and it's what's so interesting about prayer or dua in that matter is that it is a scripted um, little saying that you say for example there's one there's a script for the morning there's a script before you go to sleep there's a script during you yeah. know all kinds of things and sometimes even there's an encouragement of a certain number of repetition like repeat this three times repeat this a yes. hundred times and we don't know why Islam is about submission, but now um, that we know a little bit about what, how the brain uh, works, and I did a whole TED talk about this, is that there's two systems in the brain. There's one that's logical that you're using right now as you think about what question to ask next. Yes. Did I ask that question? Did I not ask that yes. question? And I'm saying to myself now, oh man, I should have mentioned that yeah. study, right? That's the logical system. Yes. But then there's also the reflexive system that's People sometimes have called it the non-conscious, the unconscious, and it's that system that's really interesting. It's like the little robot in your head that really is responsible for a lot of decisions that you make that are outside your awareness. A lot of the implicit bias that you have, your judgments of people, mm -hmm. uh, your automatic response where you're like, oh, did I really say that? I didn't mean to say it, but actually you did. It's yeah. in your brain. So when you say scripts, um, like the way we have it in Islam, these dedicated scripted du'as, word by word, right? Uh, the number is indicated, the time for them, the location for the dua is indicated. It's a way of programming your unconscious or your reflexive mind so then your re mental reflexes are in compliance with um, God's words. You can't get more, po more yeah. positive and more perfect than responses that are consistent with God's word. So for example, let's say someone close to you, you lose someone close to you, right? Yeah. Um, God forbid. And the, you know, you, if you, you don't have, kind of these scripts in your head, your response might be, why me? How could this happen to me? But he was such a good person, but she was so young. But all of these things that might make the suffering worse because you feel very, you feel like you were treated unfairly. Yeah. You feel the, like the world is not a trustworthy place. But if your script says that when this happens, your response should be, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raju'un, to Allah we belong, right? And to Allah, we return then it's a reminder to yourself whether you know exactly what you're saying or not that we are all here for a short time it's an emana and it's gonna be returned back to our Lord who created us um, religiosity enhances our mental health correct mm -hmm. yes so does that mean that someone who has a mental illness that they're not close to God okay interest very interesting question that must be asked by every single imam, by every single sheikh, by every single person in our community, yes. by everyone out there, right? Because yes. there's definitely stigma about mental health, not just in the Muslim community, but everywhere, Mainstream, yeah. right? So the question that you're asking is, there's many research that has shown that religiosity being an active in your, in, in your practices and habitual in all of these practices enhances mental health. Yes. Well, then the opposite, opposite of this, opposite, yeah. the reverse inference of this, well, somebody who has mental illness is far away from God yeah. and the treatment is to get close to God. So this reverse inference is completely incorrect. This is not a reciprocal relationship. So mental illness, there is, everybody is, comes into this world and there is a vulnerability or a test that's dedicated for that person that fits 
their childhood? Were they abused as a child? Did they go through problems as, ch as children? Um, is their spouse, like it fits them as a, like it's tailored to them and mm -hmm. it's their vulnerability and it's not because they're bad people or anything like that. Like that. So in fact, if you find yourself saying, well, you know what, um, this person is test has a mental illness because it's a punishment from God. Or if you find yourself saying that, well, I have a mental illness, I can't talk about these feelings of being sad or mm -hmm. not being able to concentrate because then I'm questioning God's will yeah if you find yourself saying things like that or I'm not gonna seek treatment because the treatment should be only prayer if I'm a good Muslim if I'm really a good believer I've heard you, people get that advice yes you are really contributing to the stigma of mental health and you, everybody should be honest to them with themselves when they hear this do they believe things like that and um, here's the thing though this is not a part of our tradition as Muslims um, all of these types of thoughts and stigma about mental health and that it's a punishment from God stems from pre-Islamic pagan times way, way, hundreds and thousands of years before Islam came. Before you know, Islam. Yes. During, for example, the Mesopotamia, um, uh, civilizations, ancient Egypt, is that when somebody has a mental illness or a physical illness, they take them to, they appeal to a god mm -hmm. to fix it. Or by the form of like, you know, uh, kind of compromising something to the God or they take them to a God or, or someone to determine are they being punished by God for a sin or is this a demon or a spirit that lives in them mm -hmm. so these are not our ancestors that's not our our tradition is your tradition my tradition the Muslim tradition is is the one uh, that stems from the golden age of Islam right just shortly after the Prophet وسلم, died a couple of hundred years after that that is our tradition that mm -hmm. is our understanding of mental illness and physical illness at large so it's the Muslim physicians who really at the very beginning saw not just mental illness but that physical illness has an emotional and psychological component that a seasoned physician has to address in you know if he or she wants to treat the physical illness imagine mm -hmm. it's the Muslims who built the first psychiatric hospital um, in Baghdad eons before any other in the West or European countries right wow. and then everybody followed after that these psychiatric hospitals included um, treatments such as music therapy occupational therapy and medication now this is amazing but because if you're in like at that time in the golden age of Islam 800 like 900s yeah. how do you know that a mental illness is biologically caused we just just in the 90s we learned about MRI and eavesdropping in the brain and measuring and knowing that these diseases are caused by biology and the brain yeah. so for them to know that their medication there's medication that can help with this that just that's amazing this is very powerful. I'm going to leave it here and we'll continue this segment in our, uh, in our next episode. So thank you very much, okay, Dr. Marwa. You're Marwa. welcome. Thank you. Hey, YouTube. We hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.